Okay, so how's everybody doing? I hope you're feeling all right. Despite all the ailments and pains we suffer as we age, right? Eh? Us boomers, I mean. Remember those years, the 20s and 30s. Oh my goodness. They were bulletproof, right? Okay, so uh, a couple things I want to touch on quickly here. Um, this, this part's going to be... Uh, a sort of tying up a few loose ends. I want to insert somewhere along the line here just this segment that I wished I would have included earlier because it's part of the foundational kind of shaping of the diorama. You know, within the the uh, eight foot by sixteen inch subject that I've now turned into a kind of demo until it's finished, and then I do the new design next year, right? So it's going to slow down a bit, but I'm just going to use it for the benefit of all of us that way. So there's one other part I want to insert about the footprint of the diorama and oblique angles and stuff. Just a quick insert there in the middle of things. Okay, so in this short clip, I just want to demonstrate oblique angle and off-center axis and demonstrate how important it is for the overall look concerning the footprint of the diorama you decide to build and, and uh, model. Notice the road and the track, they run parallel, right? Pretty much parallel to each other. But notice how the road, when I designed it, I offset, like look at the yellow center line. I offset the axis of the flow or the perspective just by about five degrees. Okay. Now there's a couple of benefits you get out of this. One is you get this, again, comparatively speaking, this, this aperture cut from the real world that you model, right? Like, like I never, or I mean, maybe I did on my very first diorama as a kid, but I learned very early on to uh, don't run roads and tracks parallel to the valance. Number one mistake, okay? See how the track also, it's running closer to the right at the end. And then, of course, when you get down to here, it turns into a main and it runs a few inches from the valance here, which I might also add. I don't run track uh, uh, more than or uh, less than a couple inches from the front of the valance. I made the mistake of knocking a, a dual uh uh, end scale MU locomotive set one time of my own onto the shop floor from reaching over and it'll never happen again, right? So that's the benefit of that. Um, and even if you're viewing from this angle or this angle, it's still a benefit, right? You can see that. So this is forced oblique angle. Or you force the aperture. So when you put a camera on it, it's even more rich, right? And then just in closing on this one, notice the buildings, these backdrop buildings. Okay, so they taper along the same off-center axis as well, right? See the top? See the left over there? And then the right here? So these buildings are sliced on an angle, right? See? So there's force perspective again. Very subtle though. Only f like you only need to do it like by about five degrees and it'll work. See? And then of course the fence, like just this is important as well. So the fence is going to run pretty much against the backdrop in behind the trees here, but uh, it's going to come out. A little bit like a wedge as well, right? For the other flat that we're going to build and put in here. So that helps reinforce that particular perspective within the aperture. So this is an aperture, you know, this is an aperture, right? You get the meaning, right? This is an aperture. This is a 
this is okay. Okay, so uh, let's um, revisit the fence here for a second here too, because we're building this in tandem with the building flats, right? Like this goes in behind the fence. So you can see I'm going to add four posts here. And this is uh, 1 16th rod. I'm going to add four posts here uh, in behind, and uh, I'll explain to you why in just a second here. Just touch those on with a I'll put a little bit of a square on there because we want to maybe have these square as well. I'll be able to drill 1 16th holes in the, because uh, the surface is panel board, right? The, the Glover Road diorama is not built on foam, it's just built on quarter inch uh, mahogany. There's, there's foam sections glued to the bottom to, for sound deadening, where the track is. Uh, let's see, where was I going to cut that fence in? Right there. So we're going to put that. Actually, I'm going to make that right here. I know. That's where it's going to go. Yeah, right here. Okay, I'll just throw that aside and deal with that later. Okay, so uh, we're going to lay on uh, some conduit uh, pipe along the top here. Right? I'll show you how we'll do that so that it, uh, it shows a bit better than just laying just a plain piece like this. Okay, so onto the conduit and the uh, uh, rivet uh, toot tutorial. Actually, I think I already showed that in one of the other cuts there, but uh, I'll show you how I do one of the methods for conduit mount. So I take some uh, number 8204 HO scale 2 by 4s that's just the dimensions, right? Okay, take one of those. And then for the conduit pipe, I'm going to use number 219 and number 218. 20 thou and 25 thou rod. Okay, right here. So I'm going to cut uh, a bunch of brackets. In this case, uh, it'll be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, and this is little mark here is 20 mil roughly or a quarter inch. So I'm going to cut uh, just a bunch of these, right? And again, I'm not overly worried about exact proportions here. Two, four, six, eight, nine. Because if you're on a budget, you don't want to waste this stuff too grossly here. But I'll talk to you about waste for a second. There was a guy that I knew in the film industry that uh, he was like he built a whole summer home from all the waste from 
uh, set building on a particular film. Like he would take every flat, every board and, and chunks of plywood and panels with even, you know, artistic scenic painting on it. And, and uh, he would walk around with a, uh, like a hockey puck sized magnet on a string tied to his belt, walking around, dragging it across the soundstage, picking up thousands of screws, discarded screws, because once you pull the screw from a flat, you throw it out, right? Why? Because uh, if you reuse the screw and it's, and it's, it's stripped a bit, and then a camera comes in at $1,500 a minute, you can't get the screw out. Like you can't wild the wall, they call it, in an instant. Not good. So we're going to lay on these, um, these little conduit mounting brackets, right? So we're just going to put a dab of paint. See if I can get away. The solvent dries really fast. I'm going to offset this one a bit. Because I'm going to have a power box here. Just say it once you got to get into a groove, right? We're coming off cold here, but once you get into the groove, you get a bit of build momentum going. I'll just throw this in. So, if you want to put a bend in a nice round bend like this, just take a round tool, drill bit, whatever, and then go like this. Put your thumb over and just slowly, right? Just bend it around that tool. Uh, things flow a lot more smoothly. Anyway, so I just want to mention this little story about cats, because I know some of my followers here are uh, cat lovers and dog lovers too. I love dogs and cats. But I used to get into this sort of jabbing debate with one of my professors back in the day about cats versus dogs, right? He hated cats. Anyway, I used to tell him, well, cats are way smarter than dogs. He said, oh, no, no, right? And I told him this story. I said, well, you know, I had this cat, this male cat, beautiful male cat, but I never drew a drop of blood from me. His name was Jethro. And uh, every morning, Pablo, my dog, would follow him and here would come Jethro around the corner with Pablo and Toe licking his rear end. <laughs> like the Jethro actually trained, he, he actually trained the dog to do that. He did it every day. Now if it was the other way around, the dog would get away with it once, right? Anyway, that's my argument with uh, you know, against cats versus dogs in terms of smartness. For those of you that uh, have cats, you can relate, and I'm sure you have some stories of your own. Oh, there's Dusty. Hey, Dusty. She heard the story of it, right? She came over to say hi. Hi, Dust. Yeah, right. How are you? You like that story, eh? She's pining for her walk. She's a routine, and I haven't uh, uh, taken her out for a walk yet. I put her, take her outside on the porch. She doesn't go down on the ground. There's too many coyotes around here. 
to make short work of poor little dust so I don't let her down but she likes to go out every morning in the afternoon for a five minute walk on my shoulder or ten minutes so I'm just laying on this uh, conduit here just eyeballing it right oh am I getting off camera there sorry Try to, it's a bit of a balancing act, staying in close and staying in the aperture here. Okay, so I'll put that there. So I'm going to lay three pieces on here. I think there's two different sizes here, but I'm not going to be overly uh, concerned about that, about how I line those up. See, it starts to go faster, see? Okay, so one more. Use a small one here. Um, so you get the idea, right? Just run it along. Grab the end and pull, right? Sometimes it helps just to let a few of them set up. I'm going to have a power box here. Okay, so let's just nip off these ends right here. Leave just a little bit of overhang. Finish gluing that one up so it doesn't get caught up. Anyway, I had a dog two years ago. His name was Kilo. I loved that dog. He was a, a Doberman pincher with black lab. And uh, I took them everywhere, like like, log, like back in the days when my brother and I worked in reforestation, we were working out of logging camps up the coast here in BC. And uh, what a, this, you know how you have a dog that you just say, okay, I'll only have one like that. Anyway, what a personality this dog is. He loved everybody. Not everybody loved him because some people aren't dog people, but just a beautiful dog. I just, you know, I can't for, I'll never forget him. Anyway, we were going up on a crew boat. We had an old crew boat with twin 440 Magnum engines in it. And uh, going up the coast from uh, Port Mellon, pulp mill up to a logging camp. I was, I don't know, 15 miles up the coast or something. Anyway, halfway there, like the guys didn't want him in, in the crew cab, so they put him out back on the stern. I guess he tried to go along the gunwale of the boat to get to us up in the cab. He loved people so much, and he fell overboard halfway to camp we didn't know till we got to camp right and so we realized it so we had to go back my brother and i in the boat to find him we went all on the coast down the way looking for him there were log booms and sheer rock and walls i mean it, i thought we lost him but lo and behold when we were coming into the dock there he was at the end of the boat dock tail wagging so fast his rear feet wouldn't stay on the ground practically and leaped onto the boat before we even got close, you know, up right up to the dock. He swam, you know, I don't know what it was, seven miles, or else he ran along the booms or anything, but he knew exactly where to go, right? Amazing, you know, just an amazing dog. So dogs are great too, right? And they're smart too. But cats, I don't know, man. They're, they have an intelligence that's in a class of their own, right? But we, we love our animals, don't we? Okay, so there's the conduit pipe right there. And then uh, what I'm going to do is, is just, see how I scribe this thicker material here? This is, uh, okay, what is that? That's uh, 
30 thou, I think, or 40, yeah, I think it's 30. So you just scribe that, and look, I can snap that easier. And I'm just gonna, see that? Bang. And then I'm gonna slide this piece. Well, you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut these here. I'm gonna cut this right there. All three of those. And then what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna slide Just knock the corners down a bit with some sandpaper a bit. I usually use a nail file for this, but can't be looking around for it right now. And what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to uh, just lay that on like that. Can I get in a little bit closer here? Is that better? Yeah. So I just nip those off, and then what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to use this as a power box, okay? I'm going to add a power box here. A relay box or whatever. I'm not an electrician, but, you know, if it's art, you know, you just, like, you know, we're suggesting. It's the power of suggestion, right? And then uh, we would have maybe a larger conduit pipe uh, we're going to add here. Yeah, I'll do it like that. Try to stick with code. You know, these old buildings, like the 70s style, like buildings. Now, the reason why I like to do 70s kind of style buildings is because any locomotive will pass. Like in front of them like if you do a, a roll by you know it, 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 it like it's okay right you know if it's 70s you can use a steam engine the steam engine could be restored or just uh, it can be an early diesel it can be late diesel uh, if you build buildings around the 70s plus the building codes and and standards were pretty loose back then and all the work that you would see from the trades was based on the professionalism of the independent contractor right okay so let's just put a little bit of glue in there and uh, let's let's just put that like that and then we can run a you know from the power pole here let me turn that around from the power pole uh, we can run like a line down to that right and then down here like I don't know maybe it goes around the corner but we can always cut off these right there loose see and then run another line down to a you know a, a gauge meter down here or, you know maybe you want a generator down here detail right? we're just evolving the details right okay so yeah thanks for tuning in thanks for watching and uh, I hope you have a great day we'll see you on the next episode okay bye